talk uh, about, really it's called nuts and bolts, so it's really about what chiropractic does for the human body at what levels. So I'll get more into that. We'll give it a couple more, more minutes, about three more minutes. We'll set about 10 people. Has anyone, did you ever go for just back pain or did you have anything else going on, like headaches or digestive issues? Or just asthma? back. Okay. Back, just back. So I want to cover it all. I'm going to talk about the joints and how it affects the joints, uh, how it affects with arthritis, how arthritis occurs, uh, and then how it works with the central nervous system because it goes central nervous system travels right through the spine, so it has a direct effect on the central nervous system. So my name is Dr. Schaefer. Uh, I've been a chiropractor for 25 years. I have a practice, it's called Kimberton Chiropractic. It's right across the street from Forestas. So I first got into chiropractic when I was in ninth grade. I had uh, started having back pain right about here. And my father, he had gone to a chiropractor off and on for years. But initially they took me because they saw that my chest was developing a little bit different on one side than the other. So we went to an orthopedic doctor. And when they saw me, they saw that I had a compression fracture in my spine that had fused on one side and was creating a curvature. So they wanted to put me into a brace. Um, and I, I mean, I had some back pain, but I was also in ninth grade. And I said to my dad, it's, the pain's not that bad. So he said, all right, well, let's, we'll take you to my chiropractor and see what he says. So I went to the chiropractor, he said, yeah, you have restriction in this motion, in this area, it's compensating for what's going on in here. We're gonna get motion back in there and start to balance things out. Never had to wear a brace. So within three months of care, um, I totally, I felt fine, I didn't have any pain. So that was important to me and I was able, I, I like sports a lot, so I played a lot of sports back then. So that's how I got into chiropractic. And then it came time to where I, just, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life. And my father had been a lawyer, and he said, hey, that's a lot of reading. And I was not, like, I enjoyed reading, but not to that level. He said, I think you should look at chiropractic, because you like to be active. So, and then I found out the education, and the education for a chiropractor is eight years. It's four years undergrad, and then it's another four years when you're in chiropractic school. So I looked at that at that age and said, that's a lot of school. <laughs> but he said, it's worth it, it goes by fast. So 25 years later, here I am. Um, I really enjoy what I do, and I like going out and explaining it because I've been at parties, I've been at social situations where you'll get so much about chiropractic and people's opinions on chiropractic. So to date, there is so much research that's been done in the chiropractic field. It really started with MRIs, really opened our world up as far as research and how we had an effect on the spine and the nervous system that travels within it. So we'll get started. Uh, basically, we have an amazing body. I think everyone can agree to that. We have heart, lung, kidneys, intestines, all these different parts of the body. And this is only at some of the areas. So what runs this body? Anyone know that? What runs everything in our body? The brain. Yes, so our brain is like our headquarters. It coordinates every action within our body. And it does it through the central nervous system, which then branches out. The only way that the central nervous system can get to the rest of the body is through the spinal column. And then between each vertebrae, it becomes the peripheral nervous system, 
where it branches out on these spinal nerves and from there it branches to every part of our body. So our brain, 24 hours, seven days a week, is constantly coordinating all function in our body. It's what keeps our heart beating, keeps our lungs breathing, everything. It releases cortisol, adrenaline at certain levels. It's an amazing system. So it connects to each and every area of your body. So you actually, your central nervous system, it has an autonomic nervous system portion and it has a somatic portion. It also has a sympathetic and parasympathetic system. So parasympathetic and sympathetic, it's the part that speeds things up when your heart needs to go beat faster and it also slows things down. And it does it for all the different parts of our body. So that's what the brain is constantly coordinating. So because it's such an important system, our brain is protected by our skull and our spinal, col our spinal cord is protected by our spinal column. Now when it comes to the skull, a lot of times people think that our skull is just one solid bone, but it's actually made up of many different bones. And you can kind of see this picture here. These are all separate bones. And where they come together, they're called suture joints. So throughout the day, your skull is constantly expanding and contracting. And the reason why it needs to do that is your brain is surrounded by fluid. And that fluid travels down within the spinal column and down into the sacral area. So it works as a pump. So when you breathe in, your brain's going to expand. When you breathe out, it contracts. Your sacrum moves without us knowing. It's moving with breathing in and out. And it creates a pump to circulate that fluid and keep that spinal cord very nourished. Just some more amazing things about our body. So here is a picture. This is taking a vertebra any one of these bones and just putting it like this so we're looking through it. So this here is called the spinous process of the vertebra and this is called the body. So here's the body, this is the spinal, spinous process and then here's the spinal cord traveling within. So this is, there's all this fluid around it, this is the middle of the spinal cord and then this is where you have nerve tracts that branch off, become a spinal nerve and from there come out. And when these branch out, you have some that are branching off this way. They're called efferent, they exit the spine, and then you have other ones that are afferent coming back. And these nerves eventually branch to every cell in our body. Branches everywhere, organs everywhere. So one of the things that they say is, if you removed everything else and just left the nervous system, because you have sensory nerves for touch, you would totally be able to identify that person. If you took everything else away and just left all the nerves, you could tell because it goes everywhere. Oh. All right, so chiropractic. What we are interested in is any sort of a misalignment to these bones. Because these bones allow us to bend forward, twist and turn, but they can also become shifted out of their normal position. When they become shifted, if they move to a certain degree where they start to impede the nerve flow, it's going to have some sort of interference to the, this pathway from the brain to the rest of the body. So when you look at any one of those nerves, so we just take any one of these spinal nerves here, and you do a transection. So if you just, Say this is a nerve coming out. Basically, there's three parts to each spinal nerve. You have a motor nerve function, you have what's called an autonomic nerve function, and then you have a sensory nerve function. We are extremely aware of this part of our nervous system, which is pain. So when you look at this, you ever see a, a huge phone cable? I should have brought it with me. But Verizon has a phone cable and there's a thousand individual wires within that cable. <laughs> Our nervous system, if you were to look at any spinal nerve, there's over 100,000 individual wires or what we call nerve tracks. 
So there's a large portion of the motor nerves, that's what controls all function, muscle function. We have sensory nerves. Out of sensory nerves, you have vibratory nerves for touch, so you can feel. You have pain nerves, and then also to distinguish hot and cold. You also have autonomic nerves. These are the nerves that control our blood vessels, our glands, and our organs. It's automatic. We never think about it. So there, every organ, so your heart cannot beat without the autonomic nervous system. And it can't adjust to the outside. So say you have to run for a bus. There's a message that says, okay, there's a lot of things that happen, but adrenaline needs to be released. So there's nerves that go to the adrenal glands cortisol is re released, that increases heart rate, heart starts firing, the blood goes to the muscles, and now you can take off and run. If you didn't increase the blood flow from the heart to the muscles, you would not be able to function properly to get to run to that bus. So this all goes on and it's all controlled by the brain. So if you put pressure, say you have a misalignment here, so a couple things happen. If a vertebra rotates, that will diminish the opening to that nerve. If it laterally flexes, gets stuck there, it's going to diminish, or if a combination of both. Around each one of these spinal nerves is fat tissue and two blood vessels that come in and supply blood to the bone. So there was a scientist Actually, this, is, this study has been done many different times. But what they have found that it's eight millimeters of mercury pressure is how they weigh it, but they put pressure on the outside of the nerve, out here, the peripheral portion of a spinal nerve, and that nerve function withstood a lot of pressure, way, way beyond eight millimeters of mercury pressure. Eight millimeters of mercury pressure is the weight of a dime but it could withstand a lot of pressure without interfering with that nerve flow. When we go back here, you're going to get a good bit of information. Hopefully it won't be boring. But <laughs> <laughs> so this is a nerve root ganglion. Basically what it is is these nerve tracts come down at each level, they exit, they stop, and then they, another nerve branches off. So it's called a synapse. And this is where that happens. So these nerves that come in are myelinated, and once they leave there, oh, I'm sorry, they're not myelinated. Once they leave there, they're myelinated, myelinated which protects that nerve. So what's, that, what's that term mean, my, myelinated? Myelinated, it's just a covering that the body has produced around the nerve to protect it. Okay. So out here, these are myelinated. That's why this could handle a lot of pressure. But on the inside of this nerve root from here, they are unmyelinated. Myelination slows down the speed. So in the central nervous system, because it's not myelinated, those nerve, that speed of the nerve flow is extremely fast. So it comes down, hits the nerve root ganglion, and then it branches out. So when they put pressure here, that's where the weight of a dime decrease the function of that nerve by 40% in 15 minutes and 50% in 30 minutes. And this wasn't done by one researcher. This has been done several times and basically it's the same kind of reaction. I mean every individual can be a little bit different but basically that's the average. So it doesn't take that much to interfere with nerve transmission at this nerve root ganglion area which is where it comes through this opening. Okay. That's where chiropractic focuses because we want that nervous system to be able to fire at its greatest and this is where it can be vulnerable because once it becomes a peripheral nerve out here it can withstand more pressure but when it gets affected in here it can affect the function of that nerve. If it hits the pain portion which is only 10% that's the only time you're going to feel pressure on that nerve. The other, th and then there's those sensory nerves, the vibratory nerves, and that's for touch. If you put pressure on that part of the nerve, that's where you get numbness and tingling. Okay, so that's the only time, which is about 20% when you can combine them both. So 
is motor nerves, which you'll never feel pain. You put pressure on a motor nerve, you're not going to feel it. You put pressure on an autonomic nerve, you're not going to feel it because that's not his job. Any questions so far? Interesting? Mm -hmm. Not boring? Good. Fascinating? All right. So when it comes to a chiropractor, when they walk into our office, we're looking really at two things. We want to see the position of their spine. So we check their hip level, we check their shoulder blade level, we check their shoulder level, and we look to see if they have a head tilt. And we do this with them standing. Because basically when we see if someone's dropping, hips up, we know that there's misalignments and the body's getting compromised. Now, so once we see if they're misaligned, then we want to take a picture of that in x-ray. And we always do it with standing as opposed to lying down. If somebody lies down, we take an x-ray, you're not going to see how these joints are settling. Because your body is a kinetic chain all the way up, and the link in the chain is where your joints come together. So wherever it becomes misaligned, this is a link in the chain, they're the only places that can adapt. A solid bone can't move. You know, it's just straight like the femur. So when we check this, we want to see if we know it's misaligned, we know it's going, and then we feel the spine to see what kind of position it's in. Then we take a picture, we take an x-ray, and we'll always do it, as I mentioned, with them standing. So once we see the picture, that's going to not only show us the position as to what's going on with their spine, it's also going to show us the condition of their spine, meaning what do the discs and what do the joints look like. So each bone, each vertebral bone is very complex as opposed to most bones in the body. It has four joints above, so there's a joint here, joint here, and then on the bottom there's a joint there and a joint there. And there's also this articulation with the, vertebra, the bone above and below by the disc. Okay. So what I mentioned is once we see their x-ray, we see position, and then we look to see it, the condition. Now when it comes to joints, any joint in the body, you have the bone, and then you have this covering called cartilage, and that acts as a barrier to allow frictionless motion between the two bones. Now cartilage does not get a blood supply. So every cell in our body needs some sort of nutrition. So the way it gets its nutrition is every joint in the body is encapsulated with a fluid. It's called synovial fluid. So this is just a simple hinge joint could be like a finger joint. It has a synovial fluid. Here's a cartilage. Because it doesn't get its own blood supply, it relies on motion. If a joint doesn't move, so um, what happens with the motion of a joint is it's going to move a certain way. It's going to push toxins out that build up inside the fluid. And then certain movements are going to draw nutrients in. So that constant motion of joints is what brings nourishment in and releases its waste or its toxins. So if you don't have movement in a joint, that alone will rob the cartilage of nutrition and allow a buildup of toxins, which will break down that cartilage. That is known as osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is a wear and tear arthritis as opposed to like uh, rheumatoid, which is an <coughs> autoimmune. That's where your antibodies, for whatever reason, pick up your uh, soft tissue as foreign, so it attacks it. So that's rheumatoid. This is osteoarthritis. This is wear and tear. So a couple things happen. If this joint shifts, it's going to lose its proper motion. That starts to restrict the toxins going out, nutrients coming in. It also creates friction. So what we know also through research is within 7 to 14 days of any misalignment, that rubbing, will lay down what's called fibrinogen. The analogy is, say you go barefoot, say you go on vacation for a week, so you, the whole week, by the end of that week, you're gonna build up a pretty good layer of callus on the bottom of your foot, or if you work out, it's that friction. Well, fibrinogen is similar to that. That 
stress and friction on around that cartilage within seven to 14 days research shows it's going to start laying down this fibrinogen which is dense which further restricts motion of that joint so lack of nutrients coming in um, toxins not going out fibrinogen building up that's what really encases osteoarthritis wear and tear so is, that, is that an immune response the fibrinogen yes it is it's an immune response it wants to protect but unfortunately, it restricts motion. Do they treat the two different types of arthritis the same? They're different. <laughs> they treat them differently. Okay. Yes. Yeah, rheumatoid, they're trying to suppress that right. part of the immune system. Right. Um, what they'll do with osteoarthritis is they want to reduce inflammation. So the medical field is going to give you some sort of steroid mm -hmm. to reduce inflammation along that line. Or they'll have you go to physical therapy which physical therapy is to help restore motion into that area. So that's our focus. So that's why when we, first we look to see if they're misaligned. If they're misaligned, we know that's compromised. We take the x-ray. It lets us know how long that joint hasn't been moving well. So there's actually four phases of osteoarthritis. So this just talks about the complexity of the spinal bones because there's four joints, two above, two below, the cartilage sits in here on each side, coats the bone. That's where the spinal cord comes down and then branches out between these openings. So right here, this is a side view of the spine. This is the joint, these are the discs, these are where the nerves come out. This is a healthy joint. Here, this is a joint just like the other picture where it wasn't moving properly, and when it becomes very bad, that's extremely arthritic. That's where, and this is from the Mayo, part of the Mayo Clinic, they're putting an injection. But that's when it's gotten pretty more extreme. So not all joints will age the same way. The joint that ages is the one that's not moving properly and has stress on it. But when we see an x-ray, there's 25 different bones. There's many discs in there. And I'll talk about disc also. So those joints that are moving well, you're getting that nourishment, they'll age nicely. The ones that don't is where we see the breakdown. And there's never been a patient ever in 25 years that every one of their discs and joints were degenerated. <coughs> what usually, are they injecting there? That's typical of a steroid into that area where it's really bad. That person's in a lot of pain when it gets to that level. So there are four phases of degeneration. We call this a normal spine. So basically when we look at the spine, we're looking for balance. We want the hips level, so we look left to right balance. If this is off, the body's going to go in one direction, it's going to compensate, otherwise you'd walk around like this. So your body compensates. These compensation areas create stress also which doesn't allow the joints to move properly. So there's actually four different phases of what's considered osteoarthritis. This is a nice, healthy view of the neck from the side. We're looking to see, okay, from the side, your ear should be above your shoulder, shoulder above your hip, hip above your knee, knee above your ankle, ideally. What we're seeing a lot of, especially with young kids, are we're seeing forward head tilt, we're seeing Shoulders go like this. And it's, a lot of it is texting, a lot of it is gaming, and then also patients, uh, adults on laptops. This brings you, everything brings you forward. Whatever we do on a regular basis, our body will adapt to. Just like if we don't exercise, muscles can shorten. So when people go this way, these muscles shorten. These muscles end up doing a lot more work. That would be another talk about Muscle physiology, I won't go there, but it all has an effect on the body. So when we look at somebody when they're standing and taking an x-ray, we want them to stand what feels natural, not what feels proper, because that's where their spine's spending its time. So a nice forward curve, we look for nice open healthy discs, nice uh, joints, and then the openings where the nerves come through. We want those to be open. Here's somebody that's considered phase one. The position of their spine is no longer proper. They've completely come forward. 
they have a reverse curve in their neck instead of a forward curve, what ends up happening is the stress is going to land typically more here, not always the case because people can adapt, but we don't see any signs of degeneration. Research says this can go on for about 20 years before we start to see signs of degeneration. On average, once we see the misalignment's been there for 20 years, you're going to start seeing calcium building up around the area. So there's some bone spurs, there's rigidity where more calcium is being brought to the end plates of the vertebra. Calcium here and starting to see thinning of the discs. Now notice it's only here. This is a healthy joint, that's a healthy disc. The stress is here. Unless you get movement back in this joint and start getting the stress off of that, it just keeps going in this direction. Phase three is advanced degeneration. We see more calcification, the bone is just deforming, and then also further degeneration of the disc. Phase four, and I've seen it in my office, thankfully not that often, is fusion where the bones, the disc will actually wear down badly enough in the cartilage where bone just starts to grow on top of bone. They grow together and we call that fusion. And that's not surgery fusion, that's just degeneration fusion. In the chiropractic world, we cannot help these people. We can't even help these people because the amount of degeneration that's occurred, these disc cells and cartilage cells have lost the ability to regenerate. So all cells in our body, we even know brain cells die and get replaced. For decades, they said that didn't happen. And then back in the mid 90s, research showed that brain cells actually do regenerate. All cells regenerate. When it comes to discs, so I didn't talk about disc cells, I talked about cartilage cells, how you need motion. The same thing, and that's called imbibition, by the way, if anyone likes certain terms. Imbibition is movement of a joint drawing nutrients in and getting rid of toxins. The disc also does not get its own blood supply. Blood, I talked about how the blood vessel comes into this opening. It'll go to the bone, it feeds the bone. So these are called end plates. The top of the bone, the bottom of the bone, and there's a rich supply of blood going through that bone, and that's where discs with motion start to draw that blood in and get nutrients. So discs need movement too. If they don't move, toxins build up, they rob it of nutrition, and that causes degeneration. So by keeping that movement in the disc and the joint, those areas will grow nicely, like be able to get the nourishment they need and age nicely. So when you look at this, so I have other x-rays but that's a healthy disc. This is not, and this is definitely not healthy. It's all the same age, so it has nothing to do with the age of the person. It's the age of the joint that's not, how long has that joint not been moving properly? That's what determines osteoarthritis. And it happens in hips, happens in knees. Those joints aren't moving right, they will degenerate, and they're stress on them. Any questions so far? Yeah. <clears throat> When you're talking about the, uh, the, the angle of hips when you're standing, if you have an orthopedic problem, like if one leg is actually shorter than the other, because that happened to my brother and didn't even know he had that. Yes. So if one leg was actually an inch shorter, which is a genetic thing with him. Yes. So obviously everything was out of line and he used that back pain for a long time. Yes. And then suddenly you put that lift in the shoe and everything. It, yeah, leveled it out. It's, so once we see, when a patient comes in and we see that they're misaligned, we're going to take an x-ray because I need to, they need to see this. I want to see exactly because I can feel, but I, I can't tell how much rotation is in the joint, lateral flexion. I need to see that, feel that it's misaligned. What I can feel is lack of motion, and that's always where we adjust. So once a patient, we see, we take that x-ray, so there's more, there's more recent research that shows if there is a 10 millimeter difference in the top of the femoral heads. There's a 98% chance that they have some sort of leg length discrepancy. So if we see 10 millimeters, we do this, it's an x-ray that we take. So to this day, a lot of doctors and chiropractors 
and physical therapists are measuring the leg length from the outside, from the skin, they're creating landmarks, mm -hmm. it's completely, you can't, con you can have 10 different doctors do the same measurements, get pick their own landmarks, mm -hmm. and you'll get 10 different measurements. So what, there is a technique that is specific, and what it is is you take three shots, the patient doesn't move, you take an x-ray across their ankle, just their knee, and the top of their femoral head with a metric stick behind it. The metric stick shows up on the x-ray. You know to the millimeter the length of the femur on the right, left, tibia. You also have to take into consideration, this has been going on a period of time, so I can have somebody in their 50s. By the time they stop growing, because of this stress and lack of proper motion, they'll start to, the meniscus will start to break down. Or the hip, the acetabular, that's the hip joint. So you have cartilage that lines that. That synovial fluid sac is called a bursa because it's just a large sac of synovial fluid. So that's coated. Typically the lower side is where most of the stress goes. You hear about all these people getting their hips replaced. That's osteoarthritis majority of the time. There are cases where it's rheumatoid. But majority of the time it's osteo wear and tear. It was preventable. They're showing when people have these leg length discrepancies, those are the hips that are wearing down if they just had a five, whatever, lift, a five dollar lift in their shoe, they could have prevented that along with all the compensation going into their low back. So we do that. Now there are times, so what we do is once we determine if they're misaligned, if they're less than 10 millimeters, or even if they're nine, I'll probably do that x-ray. But if they're around eight or seven, it's possible that it could have shifted this way it's a whole nother talk, but we talk about the feet. The feet are extremely important. I'll just, real quickly, when you start to lose, you have three arches in the bottom of your foot. When they start to break down, it allows the foot to start to roll in. It's called pronation. It's also known as flat-footed, as it becomes flattened. And what happens is when the foot rolls in, the tibia rotates out, femur rotates in, and the hip drops. Now, everybody can compensate to a degree, but basically that's what they say, the kinetic chain, that's what happens with the lower part of the body. So we look at those two. We also, we do laser foot scans to measure because we want to know if they're misaligned, why? Because the adjustments, so say um, there's no leg length discrepancy, there's nothing to do with the feet, the joints have been misaligned, say they're in a phase two, well, that's been there a long time. That's been there at least 20 some years. So there's restrictions. So when we check the patient, we're not just going to adjust the area that's misaligned. If, if there's compensation going on in the spine, but that joint at this time has good motion, hasn't been laying down, if it's more of a recent compensation, we leave that alone. It's only the joints that don't move and really what an adjustment does, and that's what chiropractors do, is we feel the joint that's not moving properly, we know the condition of it, so we get an idea on how long it's going to take to reverse that damage. But an adjustment is a force that we put into the spine, and it's specific to that one area that doesn't move well. We never want to create a hypermobile joint, we just want to start restoring function to that joint. As we adjust and start breaking up those adhesions, the patients is going, are going to start to experience better motion, so when it's the neck, it's one of the first things patients say is, I can turn better. Well, that's because that joint that, that wasn't moving properly, we're breaking up the adhesions. One of the wondrous things about the body is it's always trying to heal itself. Part of the body's immune system, they're called phagocytes. They are constantly traveling within our body. What, they're like the garbage collectors. They collect dead white blood cells, red blood cells, all cells are collected. By these phagocytes, they dump it into the lymphatic system, and then the lymphatic system flushes it. So as we break that up, it restores motion. Whatever we break up, body is getting rid of. And over time, that's going to improve the motion. And what we'll see on a re-x-ray is a space, this space that is narrowing, will start to open up. We also want to reposition the bone back towards neutral. So as I mentioned, say we didn't have any you know, the foots look good. Uh, they weren't at that level where we had to do the x-ray. Say they're about seven millimeters off. If we don't see a certain amount of change in a certain amount of time, then we're going to check the leg length. 
because that could be the culprit. But we expect certain amounts of change within a certain amount of period when we re-x-ray to see the change going on to the spine. So when it comes to chiropractic, it's really about making sure these joints have proper motion, all of them. Because you can do stretches. Stretches are very important, but they're really important for muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So as I mentioned, so someone has a forward head tilt. These muscles, neck flexors, they shorten. These get overworked. So we want an adjustment alone will never bring back a cervical curve. So what we do is we adjust the joints in the neck, get that moving properly. We have them lay on a rolled up towel. They just make it home and we give all the instructions. We determine where it should be placed to create a fulcrum to bring that back. And that stretching is gonna re-educate the muscles to allow everything to go back. But a stretch is a force you're putting into the body that's covering a region. So say people, you know, they're stretching their low back. Well, so one of the things that another, an example of the low back is a lot of times these become weakened, this comes up or this becomes very strong and it's holding that. If it's been doing that for years, it's gonna lay down fibrotic tissue around these joints. If we just allow, just did stretching, in this case, the patient would flatten their back to the floor and squeeze their abdominal muscles. What if they just relied upon that, the joints that weren't moving properly, you're putting a force in, the force will go to the point of least resistance. So these joints that are already moving nicely, but this one that's not, as they do this stretch, this is stretching nicely, but this is stuck. So that's really the advantage of an adjustment. It's a specific force pinpointed into that region to get that moving, and then we give stretches so it all moves and one of the analogies I like to use is a centipede. You ever see a centipede walk? They're digital. You know, it's like digits. And it's, it's very interesting. The spine is very similar. You want all 25 of these bones, which includes the sacrum as the 25th, moving properly and nicely. But joints that are laying down fibrotic tissue, they're not moving well, but the ones above and below start moving in excess. So once we start restoring the motion and we check in to see it's correcting, patients uh, feeling better ranges of motion, at the end, we want to, once it's corrected, now we want to stabilize and strengthen the area to help support it. Muscles will strengthen a lot quicker than ligaments and tendons. So it's a process. They don't get adjusted the whole time, but they need to continue to do those exercises to strengthen the muscles until ligaments and tendons Am, am I right in, in thinking that for osteoarthritis, the more motion, the better, as far as reducing pain? Well, it depends because if that area, so where there's arthritis, there's inflammation. So if you're just creating more stress in an area that's misaligned, producing inflammation, and you try to get more motion, and you're moving it, but it's in the wrong position, you're going to create more pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not just more motion, but proper motion. Increased proper motion for a joint, it will reduce pain over time because that tissue will start to heal and become healthy again, depending on what phase. As I mentioned, you're getting out here, these cells start to lose the ability to regenerate back to where they belong. But on average, what we have seen is really three quarters of the way through a phase two, that diso will totally, it will go back. When we see the x-ray, that'll start to match up with these other ones. When you were saying before you were doing like an adjustment or manipulation on your lower back, what happens when we hear you like crack? Yes, that's a great question because that freaks people out. Yeah. Especially the neck because it's louder in the neck. That's so. So what's that crack? Yeah, I'm gonna explain. Okay. So remember I talked about the synovial fluid. So each joint is encapsulated with this fluid. When there is a, mis when there is a misalignment, you're gonna put pressure on the one side, you create a gap on the other. As there is motion in fluid, gas will start to build up. So I, I don't know personally, but I do know it's nit I've learned it's nitrogen and carbon dioxide because people have asked, well, how do you know it's not methane? You know, these are these patients. 
<laughs> so it's carbon dioxide and nitrogen is what they say, and it builds bubbles of gas in there. So when it's called cavitation of a joint, it's like bubble wrap. So what we do is where it's jammed, we're taking pressure off that, we're bringing it back towards neutral, it closes that other side for an instant, and it pushes gas out. So that's what you hear? That's, that's the popping. Now, gas builds pressure. Pressure creates discomfort. So you will see a lot of young kids. I, I did it. I was constantly cracking my neck, my upper back. I couldn't get comfortable because I had these misalignments, and gas was were building up inside these joints. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I tell people, because they'll say, oh, doc, I've been adjusting my own neck, and I get it, but I was getting pops for years, but now I can't get the pop. I can't get it to release. Well, they're, they're restricting. There's more restriction in that joint, and they feel that that pop, every time they hear a pop, it's going in the right direction. It's not. It can be moving in the wrong direction. It could be moving in the right direction, because most people, they'll go, or they'll go, and they're releasing. They're not doing anything to re-educate that joint with the muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So nothing gets corrected. I have all ages. I have a job. I've gone in the hospitals to check newborns because they can become misaligned, and that's a whole other topic. But it's called in utero constraint when they learn. So there's a lot of things that can cause the spine to become misaligned. Delivery can cause the upper cervicals. But I'll go in the hospitals check. That's just impulse to move their bones. It's like so easy. Toddlers, so all ages, when we have teenagers come in, they're usually the ones that have been cracking and, and the first thing they have to know is they have to stop. Because what's happening is if they're going to keep cracking their neck and I'm only adjusting their spine back towards neutral each visit, they're going to mess with the correction. They're just going to create a hypermobile joint. So it's not going to correct. So that's a big thing that we tell, do not pop your neck. Do not crack because we can't correct. We can't re-educate that area. You're constantly popping. But your lower back. Same thing. Same thing? Yeah. People twisting like this. Mm -hmm. And then, so another thing when people twist their back, because a lot of times people like doing that exercise where they bring their legs up, let them roll to the side, then they bring them up and let them roll all the way to the other side. Well, if you have a disc that's being wedged and you create this torque, you're going to start tearing at those disc fibers. So some people doing that, where you bring your knees up, go all the way to the side, go all the way side, is healthy, it's good. But if they have wedging, where they have this increased curve and they're creating all this pressure on the back of that disc, you create tearing by doing, because you're creating a you have pressure going on to it and then you're creating a shearing force. So, and that's the same thing with cracking, like this. If they have an increased curve and they're creating that shearing, it could be creating more damage. Okay. Any other questions? You shouldn't do yoga then, right? <laughs> What's that? Avoid yoga. Well, without, depending without, on the yoga. Make sure your spine is okay. Yeah, well, yoga, I love yoga for a lot of reasons. Um, it depends. There's different levels of yoga, but there is different conditions. So, yeah, if you have this and you do this big twist, you could, you're going to be harming it. Um, but I do, I think yoga is phenomenal for people, for stretching and balance. And so as we age, you want to keep those synapses going with the balance because people start to lose the, their balance as they age. All right, so these are same thing. There's four phases of degeneration with the spine. Um, so as I mentioned, so the position of the spine is where they come in. I palpate their <coughs> spine just to get a feel for what's going on, which just means I'm feeling. I'm feeling the muscle tone. I'm feeling the position of the bone. A muscle that's compromised, the muscle tone's going to be different on one side than the other. If we find that they're missing out, we take an x-ray, and then the x-ray lets us know what's the position and condition of their spine. And then often, so many times, I'll have a patient come in with neck pain or low back pain, but I check their spine, the whole spine, and there could be, when we x-ray, the area that's painful could be in a phase one, their neck, which, and they'll say, oh, what's my range of motion? And it's very limited, but they don't have pain. They could be in a phase two or phase three. So the condition of your spine 
how much degeneration doesn't always coincide with pain. And that's like that with a lot of uh, parts of health, like cardiovascular disease, you may not feel pain until there's a lot of damage done, cancer, well it's the same thing when it's the nervous system. You, your spine can be in worse condition than what you feel. That's why we don't x-ray based off of feel, we, or off of how they're feeling, we x-ray based off of alignment and motion, lack of motion. Okay, does anybody have any questions? More questions? Yes. Well, what if you have a herniated disc? Okay, um, so there are times where you do not touch a herniated disc. There are times when you can. So, unfortunately, I don't have an MRI up here. So the spinal cord's back here. Here's a disc. If a disc just bulges backwards, a bulging disc, straight back, a chiropractor can adjust, assist, and allow that bulging to go back towards where it belongs. That's what you have the bulging. If it bulges to a point where it's more tearing going on, so the disc, the makeup of a disc is inside is a fluid-filled gel-like substance called the nucleus pulposus. It actually, as far as balance and what's going on with the joint, it's like a ball bearing. Around that fluid are all these collagen fibers, strands, and it, it creates a matrix. And it's to support that and allow flexibility through that joint so the bones can shift. When that, that matrix of collagen fibers starts to tear, that fluid in the middle starts to seep out in that direction where the weakening is. How does that weakening happen? Bad motion, what they call aberrant motion of the joint. There's unequal pressure on that disc that's creating uh, stress. If it's not moving well, it's being robbed of nutrition. Those cells start dying, allowing tearing. So it all goes back to a joint needs to move to be healthy. So when that starts bulging or going out, if it bulges back and drops, if it drops a little bit, a chiropractor can still work on it. If it drops to a certain level, there's no way for that to go back. So that's where we have them, typically I recommend neurologists, but orthopedic surgeons, but over the years I've had great uh, success with going with a neurologist with my patients down at the University of Pennsylvania. Not that I'm plugging them, but any doctor that has knows what to do. So you've heard of discectomies. A discectomy is where they just cut that part of the disc out. They remove it, allow it to heal, and that is an extremely successful surgery. When they start bolting and fusing bones together, there's a couple things that can go wrong with that. One is it's not always successful because if it heals, if it heals in the wrong position as they fuse those two together, there could be continued problems. So I won't, you can look that up yourself and know this, their success rate on those type of surgeries, which is not very good. But it does, there is success at times. But percentage wise is very low. But discectomies are extremely successful. When the other thing that can happen is if you fuse two bones together with a surgery, now the body, these bones are all segmented. They're supposed to have a certain amount of motion to all of them. When you restrict motion here, motion is now, you're going to increase the force on this disc and this disc and joint, and over time, then you, you can start wearing that down, and it's possible that they have to do the next one. Okay. For osteoarthritis. Right again, osteoarthritis of the knees. Uh, if it's bone on bone, is that roughly the same as phase three and phase four of them? Yes, exactly. Okay. It's beyond. So that's, I do work on knees, I work on ankles, I work on any joint. It's all about getting motion and alignment back where it belongs. So tibia, as I mentioned, the foot starts pronating, tibia rotates out, that torquing on the meniscus can, will de mess up the motion of that joint. So there is an adjustment we do, and it's called a traction adjustment, where you distract, bring it back to a point of slight resistance, and then over time, you'll break up the adhesions and start to realign it. It's, but only if they're in a phase one and two, maybe up. So you can reverse and have success with symptoms from here and reverse it from going in this direction. But if I have a patient about here and beyond, 
that's where I will refer them to a neurologist because these cells are so damaged, they might regenerate a little bit, but not much. So it would be a waste of their time to come for care. So if uh, the knee is even up to here, I'll work on them. I'll let them know it's never going to be what it once was, but we can see how far back we can bring it. Same thing with the spine. When we re-x-ray, we're not only looking for correction for this curve to come back, but we're also looking for the disc space to improve. So say somebody doesn't, they've lost that curve and they haven't uh, done any of their stretching. We'll still see their disc space improve, but we won't see the correction because they didn't work with the muscles to re-educate. Does that make sense? If they didn't stretch the muscles, it's not going to hold their adjustment alone. is not going to bring their head back. It's going to align it this way, but it's going to increase motion, and then those cells will regenerate, and you'll start to see them open. So I'm pretty emphatic about patients doing their stretches, but it doesn't matter when you deal with the public. Some people do them, some people don't. Typically, when you see that first re-X-ray and you see the disc space is opening, and that muscle's tight, so they have better range of motion. Sometimes it goes more forward if you're not doing the stretch, which is pulling them. They'll see that, and I'll say, just do your stretches, and then that'll come back. Okay. The phases for neoxyarthritis are determined by X-ray. Yeah, it's the same. Any joint you can well, the foot's. A, You'll still see the foot, but they're smaller joints. They're more, they're harder to determine. But knee joints, totally. You can tell which phase of degeneration. Hip joints. I have a guy. He's the he uh, division one uh, referee. He's towards the latter part, and he's so. I mean, so four to six millimeters is a healthy joint spacing in this acetabulum. This one in particular patient. He's about two one and a half, two. He's had pain because inflammation occurs and he, he's being seen by his orthopedic doctor. He comes to me because we do a technique. It's also a distraction technique um, where we're just opening it up. There's a certain way we do that. And we'll re-x-ray. So we initially we're able to get more space, but then it stopped because he was like, he was about here. But it, it got to a certain point and then it just stopped. But he's still, he's refereeing this year. Um, the, the doctor says eventually you will need to replace that hip. But right now, keep going to your chiropractor because he saw the before and after x-rays. He said, it's keeping you going until you want to retire. But there's, and there is. I mean, we tell him there's a point where you've only been here. Um, you know, you can try to maintain that with chiropractic adjustments, but it's really hard when there's so much impact going on and they aging. Do your, uh, your treatments and procedures reduce inflammation? So the process of restoring motion to that joint, drawing in better nutrients, yes. As you that joint becomes healthier and you take the stress off the joint, inflammation will not lay down. It's not instantaneous because it's a process of getting, breaking up the adhesions and getting that bone that joint into more of a neutral position because inflammation is laying down because there's irritation. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out. If you have more questions, I'll be around.